NTDC VFS. This is Mission Control Houston at the T minus nine minutes and holding mark. Flight controllers belonging to the ascent team have been on control since here about one o'clock this afternoon, monitoring Endeavour systems in preparation for the fourth shuttle launch of the year. The ascent team is led by Flight Director Brian Lunny with the assistance of astronaut Alan Poindexter, who's the spacecraft communicator or CAPCOM. Poindexter will be talking directly to the crew during Endeavour's eight and a half minute ride to orbit. They're joined on console by Flight Director Richard Jones and astronauts Greg Johnson and George Zamka, who are monitoring weather conditions at Kennedy Space Center. Point Dexter and Johnson are in direct contact with astronaut Steve Lindsay, who is flying the shuttle training aircraft around the vicinity of the shuttle landing strip at the Cape. Among other things, he's assessing today's uh, weather conditions, but at the moment, uh, everything is within the handling capabilities uh, in the event of a return to launch site aboard. At the time of Endeavour's launch, the International Space Station will be orbiting 212 statute miles above the South Pacific. Endeavour's launch is timed to match the moment when the Earth's rotation carries launch pad 39A into the corridor or plane of the station orbit. Endeavour's launch window opens at uh, precisely 6.55.39 seconds p.m. Central Time and lasts 4 minutes 39 seconds until 7 p.m. and 18 seconds. Down the hall from the shuttle flight control room, another team of flight controllers is on duty in the International Space Station flight control room, led by Flight Director Royce Renfrew as they watch over the activities of the Expedition 18 crew aboard the space station. Commander Mike Fink, NASA Flight Engineer and Science Officer Greg Shamatov, and Russian Flight Engineer Yuri Lanchikov have been preparing for Endeavour's arrival for the past month. Shamatov has been aboard the station for 168 days following his launch aboard the shuttle Discovery in May. Fink and Lanchikov are in their 34th day in space since their launch October 12th in a Soyuz rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. They arrived on the station on October the 14th to begin their half year on the complex. This was a light duty day for the station crew with periodic fitness checks, experiment activities, and final airlock preparations for the four spacewalks planned on STS-126. They also watched the Progress 30 cargo ship undock from the Zvezda service modules aft port at 10.20 a.m. Central Time today. Station crew is expected to watch this evening's launch on a television uplink from Mission Control. Shuttle flight controllers here in Houston also are watching weather conditions at the overseas abort sites in Spain and France, which would be used in the event of an engine failure early in Endeavour's climb to orbit. Zergos of Spain is considered the prime transoceanic abort site today for Endeavour and its crew. Current forecast calls for go conditions at all three European sites. At launch, Endeavour will be sent aloft on the collective power of its three liquid-fueled main engines and its twin solid rocket boosters, combining for a total of 7 million pounds of thrust. About 30 seconds into the flight, following its roll maneuver, Endeavour's computers will throttle the main engines down to 72% or rated performance to lessen the aerodynamic forces on the shuttle's external fuel tank and the orbiter's aerosurfaces. Shortly after solid rocket booster separation, Endeavour's orbital maneuvering system engines will ignite for about a minute and 43 seconds, providing an assist for the shuttle as it heads uphill. A little less than six minutes into the flight, Endeavour's onboard computers will command the shuttle's main engines to swivel, allowing Endeavour to roll to a heads-up position above its modified external fuel tank during the ascent. That maneuver will allow Endeavour to gain more favorable communications with the tracking and data relay satellite system. About eight and a half minutes after launch, Endeavour's main engines will be commanded to shut off and the shuttle will separate from its external fuel tank. Endeavour will settle into an elliptical orbit about 135 statute miles above the Earth at its apogee, which will be refined to a higher orbit above the Earth about 45 minutes into the flight through a firing of the shuttle's orbital maneuvering system engines. Additional rendezvous maneuvers will be executed over the course of the next two days, bringing Endeavour to a docking with the International Space Station on Sunday. Seconds after discarding the external fuel tank, Commander Chris Ferguson will be maneuvering Endeavour so that the video and digital still cameras embedded in the shuttle's umbilical well can capture image of the tank as it falls away. And about a minute and a half after the umbilical well imagery is obtained, mission specialists Stephanie Piper and Pettit will collect handheld imagery of the tank from a distance of about 1,400 feet. All of that will be downlinked for analysis by imagery experts uh, on the ground three and a half hours into the flight. And since the separation will occur in darkness, there's going to be no opportunity to gather handheld video of the tank. 
And over seven crew members will go to work shortly after the shuttle's payload bay doors are open, activating systems, unstowing gear, and preparing for their eight-hour sleep period, which is scheduled to begin about 2 a.m. Central Time Saturday night. Again, the ascent team uh, and flight director Brian Lunny is all set to take over control at solid rocket booster ignition of the 22nd flight of Endeavor, the 27th mission in shuttle program history, and the 31st space shuttle night launch. At T minus 9 minutes and holding, this is Mission Control Houston. Go ahead, SP. Yes, ma'am. We've got some words from CGSS on the white room configuration for you. And I'm ready. All right, NT, CGSS. Um, yeah, we looked at it. Um, we did verify that uh, the pin is not installed, so the door is um, loose. Um, there is a handrail out of the out the uh, outboard side, so the door, uh, in a worst case scenario, um, would uh, not be. It's not going to be able to. Uh, swing all the way out and contact the orbiter. Um, there's a physical handrail that's going to stop it. Um, at this point in time, we're just um, just going to um, looking at the fact that we're going to sustain a little bit of damage and uh, and just deal with that. And uh, we're ready to support. And uh, just uh, we just like you to brief the crew that um, if there's a possibility that they have to get out. That they, um, they're just going to have to deal with that. Um, the hatch. It's no interference with the hatch opening or anything like that, but it's just um, it's going to be flopping around in there. They're just going to have to push it out of their way. And no issues with the hatch opening, is that correct? That is correct. And your recommendation uh, is go for launch in this configuration? That's correct. CGSS launch director? Go ahead. Yeah, would you characterize the vibration that we can expect on that door as the vehicle is descending? Uh, obviously, it doesn't reach its max until the, until the main engines and the SRB pass by, but early in ascent, when it might become a debris hazard, what, what kind of vibration levels are you talking in there? Well, there's, there's, an, there's enough vibration as it, as it passes to break the, the lights inside the white room. Um, it bounces around. A bit, but um, we don't think that anything is going to um, fatigue or break off or anything. Um, we don't think it's it, it's going to bounce around that bad to where it's going to break the door off or anything to that. Right. Matter. No, I don't think so either. The worst vibrations are as the SRBs pass by. So, okay, copy. NTDSB. Go ahead. Hey, Charlie, from my perspective, two things we're going to need to go do. Number one, we will watch the uh, OA configuration during retraction, and, uh, and, and I think we shall be watching that if it does exactly what we think it's going to do. Even if the door swings open and contacts the rail, that's the configuration that, that we would expect it to be in. A little word you need to pass the crew that that could be the expected configuration if, in fact, they have to reopen the hatch and after we've re-extended the orbit access on. And I copy that, SP. And SPE, do you concur with CGSS's recommendation of go for launch in this configuration? I do concur. I am go for launch in this configuration. And CDR, NTD, T1T? Uh, CDR copies all, and uh, we understand, and we're go. And I copy. And SPE, NTD, verify, ready to resume count, and go for launch. Yes, go. And launch director, NTD. Launch director. Yes, sir. Step 1124, our launch team is ready to proceed. Okay, I copy that. I'll do my poll at this time. KSC Chief Processing Engineer, verify no constraints to launch. No constraints. Thanks, Steve. KSC Safety and Mission Assurance. KSC Safety and Mission Assurance is go. Copy. Payload Launch Manager. Payload to go, Mike. Thank you, Gennaro. Range Weather. Weather has no constraints to launch. Thank you, Kathy. And Ops Manager. See launch director, ops manager on 212, Mike. The MMP is not working any issues. You are go to launch. Okay, thank you, sir. Endeavor launch director. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Okay, Fergie, the vehicle's in good shape. The weather's beautiful. And so on behalf of the entire shuttle launch team, good luck, Godspeed, and have a happy Thanksgiving on orbit. Kudos to your team, Mike. It's uh, our turn to take uh, home improvement to a new level uh, after 10 years of international space station construction. Endeavors ready to go. Copy that. Thank you, sir. And to do with that, you are clear to proceed. I copy that. And it's on the net. We have 14 seconds left in our remaining hold here at 9. 